Oh, man. I'm so excited. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, when I was 10, I got my first computer. I think a lot of you have seen this computer. Uh, and it was the best day of my life. And I asked my mom. She basically spent everything she had so that I would have something to do during the summer while she was doing her two jobs. And I asked, well, can I get the internet? She said, OK. So I got the internet. It's the first day. Turned it on, dialed up, and went onto Metacrawler and started searching the X-Files. And I found all these awesome websites all about the X-Files. And I just played sound clip after sound clip after sound clip. You had to like, wait for it to download. But now as I was doing that, I finally found, I was like, man, maybe there are people who want to chat about the X-Files with me. So I found message boards. Uh, today we call them forums. Uh, and I went on and I started chatting. I was like, hey, who wants to chat about the X-Files? What's your favorite episode? And I'd refresh, and I'd refresh. Like two hours later, someone responded. I was like, yes. <laughs> and I responded, and then I'd refresh. I just sat there refreshing. I'm like, there's got to be a better way. So I start searching some more, and I find something called IRC, Internet Relay Chat. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I can actually chat with people who want to talk about this kind of stuff. So I go in. I go into this, the first chat room I find. And I say, hey, who wants to chat about the X-Files? And someone says, get out. <laughs> like, what? No, I just want to chat about the X-Files. We can chat about whatever episode you want. And he says, you have 10 seconds to get out of this chat room. I'm like, what? I don't, I don't even know you, a uh, random guy on the internet. So no. So I wait, and 10 seconds later, my brand new computer that my mom spent everything she had crashed. And I freaked out. I had no idea what to do. So whenever something bad happens to your computer, I think the first thing you're supposed to do is like unplug it. So I unplugged it from the wall. And I gave it like 30 minutes for the bad stuff to like get out of the computer. <laughs> I think that's how they work. And I plugged it back in. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be grounded for the rest of my life. And I turned it back on, and I just, I knew I was in a lot of trouble. It was like sweat coming down my face. And I turned it back on, and everything was okay. I was like, oh my God, thank God. And in that moment, with just the adrenaline like rushing through my body, still a little scared, but happy that everything is okay, I thought, that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> How do I do that? And that basically spiraled down for the rest of my life, trying to figure, how do I do that? And not to be malicious, right? But something really intoxicating about being able to control a system, a machine, a framework, something that you don't know nothing about the moment before. I think that's really exciting. That's very cool. So I started looking into it, and I started trying to find other chat rooms where people talked about this. Screw the X-Files. Let's talk about hacking. <laughs> and I found what happened. Someone had used something called WinNuke95. Who remembers WinNuke? So this is the denial of service attack that was used to crash my Windows 95 computer. All you need to do is enter an IP address, and it sends an out-of-band packet on NetBIOS port 139, and your machine would be attacked. Very different than today, where you have like Krebs servers going down on Akamai because millions and millions of, of machines and IoT devices distributed across a massive DDoS network get sent to one pipe. Back then, it was just a DOS. It was just one packet, right? Not millions of machines. And in fact, we didn't call it denial of service. We called it nuking. <laughs> nukes. Do you remember nukes? So I found WinNuke. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Such a cool power. And I'm not malicious in any way. I don't even want to shut down people's computers. But just the ability to do that, or the ability to show that, is so cool. So interesting. And pretty quickly, Microsoft came out of the patch. They released, I believe it was Windows 95 uh, Service Pack 2. And they fixed it. And I was like, oh no. It's like my magical power, my like ring, was gone. I don't have that anymore. I was like, oh, what do I do now? And I thought, you know what? There's a, a guy who wrote this. Uh, and his name is Burnt Bogus of the Den. If Burnt Bogus of the Den could write this, why can't I? How did he make this? And I found out that you could do something called programming and make something like this. And if you understand how a network stack works, you might be able to create a denial of service or an attack like this. Or if you learn about buffer overflows or reverse engineering, you can get into this sort of stuff. 
So at that age, around 10, I started getting into that. I started learning about programming and coding. Um, and from then on, I sort of continued down learning new types of uh, tools, like Counter-Strike. A <laughs> uh, bit more Counter-Strike. And I remember playing, playing one day, and I didn't see, I heard some footsteps going across, like panning from my right speaker to my left speaker. I was like, oh man, that must be, a, must be an enemy because I don't see them in my radar or my HUD. And I thought about it for a moment. There's like sound going, panning from the right speaker all the way to my left speaker. That must mean there's positional information about the attacker, the, the terrorist in that, in that uh, game. So maybe I can grab that information. I'm pl playing live on the internet with other people. And I start learning about packet sniffing. And I learned that I can actually figure out, I can grab information about footsteps and the positional information. And then I learned, okay, maybe I can put, inject, maybe I can write software to draw on the map so I can see where that person is, if they're behind me, for example, and take the X, Y coordinates of the footsteps and draw it out. And I learned about injection and memory injection and DLL injection and then being able to go into Counter-Strike and write code. And once I was in there, I was like, oh, you know what? Like, while we're in here, I could just like delete walls. Why don't we just do that? <laughs> that made it a lot easier. <laughs> and ultimately, uh, I started releasing these cheat, uh, I released cheats, cheats for Counter-Strike. And it all started just because I wanted to control Winamp. I wanted to change the song, and you couldn't do it from within Counter-Strike. We didn't have the cool like media keys that you do now on your keyboard. You actually had to Alt-Tab, change the song, go back into Counter-Strike, your GPU would, go, would be messed up, you'd have like blue and red everywhere, and you'd realize you just got headshotted. Um, so this was a lot cooler. This allowed me to control and hook the keyboard within the software. And I continued to do that, and then Counter-Strike and Half-Life, or Valve, I believe, actually created something called Punk Buster, and then they made my cheats stop working. So then, at this age, I was probably around 15. At this point, I started just going back and forth, and I'd release a new version, and they'd release a new version of Punk Buster and make it stop working. And I'd release a new version, and the game became fun again. Because when you have like God mode, it's not very fun. Like it's fun for a day, but then it gets boring. But going back and forth with these engineers was awesome. So at that point, <laughs> so that's kind of how I spent, you know, that year, and then the next year, and I was like, I kind of just stopped going to school because why would you go to school when you could play Counter Strike? So I stayed at home, I dropped out, uh, and I basically wrote Counter-Strike cheats for a while. And uh, at one point, um, I started playing around, I moved out, you know, at one point my mom said, oh, you know, Sammy, you're not paying rent, and I just lost my job, you have to help pay rent. And I was fortunate that I got a job in San Diego uh, doing programming. Apparently, you can make money programming, and I had no idea. I thought you could just write code cheats in Counter-Strike, and that's not the case. And at around 19, I, was, uh, I moved back to LA, uh, living in a place in Marina del Rey, and all of my friends went on a website. This was 2005. And that website was called MySpace. Who remembers MySpace? Who's still on MySpace? <laughs> no? Okay, just me. And everyone had a MySpace account. I was like, this is kind of cool. What is it? So I went, I checked it out. I, uh, it's kind of cool. You can upload pictures. You can add friends. You can write on people's walls. I don't think they called it walls, but you could write on their profiles. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, and they allowed you to do a lot of really cool things with your profile, like this. So this is my profile. <laughs> they allowed CSS and images and background colors and all sorts of stuff. And I thought, man, what could I do that would make my profile stick out, make it a little cooler? And they had a uh, drop down for relationship status. So they had, you know, single, in a relationship, married, divorced, et cetera. And I wanted mine to say, in a hot relationship. <laughs> but this wasn't, this wasn't a selection in the drop down. Now, at first I checked, are they just sending the text, right? Are they sending the, sending the text in like a post? Maybe I can just change it. But no, it's actually ID based. So they were sending an ID, you know, an ID one to 10 based off the status of your relationship. So I couldn't just send, uh, send my own text. So then I thought, what else can I do to modify the page? It was around 2005. And I realized that if I could execute JavaScript on the page somehow, then maybe I'd be able to change the text within that one portion. And I found that MySpace did not allow JavaScript. They blocked it in any way possible. Then I found that there was, essentially, I could exploit the filters within the browser to execute JavaScript in a way that technically wasn't JavaScript. I could put it in a div, in a div tag and then break the word JavaScript into two with a new line, and that would pass the filters on MySpace, break the filters on the browsers, and then still execute the JavaScript. And this allowed me to change in a hot relationship. Well, that's kind of funny. Uh, what else can I do? I thought, okay, 
if I can make someone just change their change the text of the page, maybe I can uh, make them add me as a friend. So that'd be kind of funny. If I can make someone visit my profile, now they'd add me as a friend. Now around this time, something else came out that was really, really cool. Who remembers MapQuest? <laughs> MapQuest. OK, MapQuest was kind of cool, right? It was like you got to get directions instead of using like a big Thomas guide or a big piece of paper that was like this wide. Um, you'd go in, you'd type in some uh, your source and destination, and you'd get turn-by-turn -turn directions, and you'd get a map. And if you wanted to zoom, you'd hit click, zoom, the page would refresh. Uh, you, you wanted to go east a little bit, you hit east, the page would refresh. Oh, no, too far east. Let's go west. Page would refresh. And then Google Maps. Best day of my life. Finally, you could just drag. You remember that? You could just drag the map. It was incredible. It was so cool. It was like, what are they doing? What is this like magic that they're using in the browser? This was called Ajax. So this was the Web, web 2.0. It's about 11 years ago. I was like, this technology is so cool. It's able to make all of these requests in the background. And you don't have to hear the Internet Explorer click every time like a, a new request happens. Um, and you can just keep doing those requests like dynamically. It's very, very awesome. I thought, what else can I do with this? Maybe I can use this with like the MySpace stuff I'm playing around with. So I thought, you know what? If I can do this, you know, I couldn't make someone, let's say, write a comment because they had a CSRF token. So they had a token that you had to submit if you wanted to, let's say, uh, do certain things, um, like update your profile. But I thought, maybe I can use Ajax to grab that token and then submit it. So then I realized what I could do with JavaScript is I could actually make someone visit my profile, not only add me as a friend, but add me as a hero. So now, if you would visit my profile, you would add me as a friend, but then you'd also add, but most of all, Sammy is my hero to the end of your heroes. So if your heroes section said, like, my mom, my dad, and my dead grandmother, it would now say, my mom, my dad, my grandmother, but most of all, Sammy is my hero. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So it's like, probably in a week, I'll have a bunch of friends, and uh, I'll show off to my tech, my nerdy friends, and they'll think it's funny, and that's that. So a few days go by, and I check, and I have no new friends. I'm like, oh, man. What, what, can I, uh, what can I do to make this go faster? Well, maybe I can use that Ajax stuff. That stuff's pretty cool. Um, maybe if someone visits my profile, not only will they add me as a friend and add me as a hero, but maybe I can copy the code onto their profile. So when someone visits their profile, they add me as a friend and add me as a hero and add the code to their profile. And in like a month, I should have, I don't know, six new friends in that scenario. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll try that. And I don't really expect it to work either because he writes code here. It's, it never works the first time. All right. So I put it on my profile one night, and I go to sleep. And like, you know, best case scenario in a month, I'll have like 100 friends. Someone will complain, and then MySpace will remove it. So I wake up in the morning, and eight hours later, and I'm like, check my profile. Do I have any new friends? And I have like 10,000 new friends <laughs> from, you know, the, the dozen or two that I had before. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> what do I do? At that point, I'm like, OK, I should contact MySpace. So I sent them an anonymous email. It's like, hey, something happened weird. Something to my profile. I'm just a random user. Some guy, <laughs> some guy named Sammy somehow added his profile to added his picture on my profile. And like every time I delete it, he comes back. Because apparently, whenever you delete somebody or delete some text, it goes back to your profile, which re-executes the code, which re-adds me and re-adds the <laughs> And it looks really obfuscated because they had very little text. They had very little uh, content or size that I could submit. So I had to obfuscate everything um, and just write a custom obfuscator and compressor. And when I submitted, so I submitted that. And I was like, I saw all this code on my profile. I think this is what it does. Detailed explanation of exactly how this works. <laughs> and I think if you do this one thing, you can block the whole thing. But I just wanted to stop, like stop spreading. I didn't really know what was going to happen. so. I called my girlfriend. I was like, hey, do you want to get lunch? She's like, what's wrong? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? I just want to get lunch. So I went to Chipotle, enjoyed a burrito, went back to work, was kind of freaking out, had 100,000 new friends. <laughs> and at this point, I can't do anything about it. So immediately, I'm like, I want to delete my profile, so at least my face doesn't show up on 100,000 profiles. So I, I delete my profile. I was like, are you sure you want to delete? I was like, yes. I was like, are you absolutely sure you cannot undo this? I was like, yes. OK your profile will be deleted in 24 hours. I'm like, OK, awesome, great. 
So at that point, I really had nothing to do. Uh, I was at work. I couldn't think. And I felt kind of awful because Fox had just purchased MySpace for $580 million. Uh, so I didn't want Rupert Murdoch. At this point, I just kept trying to work. Couldn't really think about it. And uh, I drove home. And at this point, it was around 900,000 profiles, 900,000 people. And these are individual people, right? I, of course, removed the, the, the worm from my profile, but it's, it's a virus. It's like a, the cold. You might sneeze on someone and get them infected, but just because you're cured the next day, that doesn't help them, right? It helps no one else. So now I'm just purely refreshing because I'm curious, like, how, how quickly this thing is working. And it's doubling basically every hour. And in under 20 hours, it hit a million, at which point I took a screenshot. Well, I took a bunch of screenshots. Um, <laughs> and then I'm trying to figure out how fast it's actually moving. It's moving th thousands of people per second, per second. And I'm refreshing and refreshing. I'm at home, just like, what do I do? Like, I feel I, uh, I did not intend for this to, to travel this, this quickly. And, uh, and then I refresh and finally says, this profile has been taken down. So at around, around a million, you know, 20,000 people, my profile was taken down. I'm like, finally, someone did it. So within a day, they were able to take the profile down and the worm down. So I was like, I wonder what happened to the other profiles. So I went to my girlfriend's profile. Does it still say Sammy's my hero? And it says, this profile is down. So I go to myspace.com and it says, sorry guys, the, everyone's here working on it. Uh, the system is down and we're all here working on it. And I felt awful. I felt absolutely terrible because I know what it's like to have servers that are down. It sucks. Uh, and I was living in Marina Del Rey and I thought maybe I should drive over. I think they're in Beverly Hills. Maybe I should go over there and just apologize, bring some coffee and donuts, be like, can I help with some SQL queries? Uh, and I, nothing happened. I, I just stayed at home, and a day went by, and I didn't really know what to expect. I was 19 years old. And a week went by, and nothing happened. And like two weeks went by, and someone emailed me and said, hey, like, we heard about your worm. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, oh, the worm with the picture of you? I was like, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> um, the one that says your name? <laughs> yeah, that was me. So I said, uh, so did you hear from anyone? Did, did MySpace contact you? And I said, no, MySpace never contacted me. Um, like, did the police contact you? He was like, no, the police never contacted me. He was like, Fox? Nope, never contacted me. No one contacted me. I was like, okay. Uh, so what do you think about uh, the shirts? I was like, what shirts? I was like, they're selling Sammy's My Hero t-shirts. I, like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's awesome. Um, are you making money off that? No, but that's okay. A month goes by, and two months goes by, and three months go by. Six months go by, I'm like, all right. That was fun. Uh, never doing that again. You know, that was a mistake. Uh, I'm glad nothing happened. I'm really fortunate for that. And one day I'm walking down to my brand new car, sweet car, and I see two guys standing next to it. And I'm like, oh no, I'm getting carjacked. They're like, Sammy? I'm like, what? Like, Sammy? It's like, yeah. And then I realize carjackers don't know your name. I say, we have a search warrant. I was like, oh no. Uh, and I don't know anything about search warrants, right? Nothing at all. But I know on 24, they always, show, they always say, show me the search warrant. So I, so I said, show me the search warrant. I was like, does that work? Like, is that real life? I didn't know. So I tried, I tried it. And they're like, okay, we'll, we'll show it to you. We'll show it to you. And then two more guys come up. And then they'll, they'll show me badges. And they're Electronics Crimes Task Force. Uh, United States Secret Service, uh, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles District Attorney, and California Highway Patrol. <laughs> Probably because of my sweet car. <laughs> and for the first time, something in the movie Hackers was real. I was getting raided by a dozen people with guns, going through everything. We walked upstairs, and there's a dozen agents in my home going through everything. My girlfriend is in sheets crying. My roommate is in a bath towel, upset, really pissed. Apparently, what had happened was they went to the complex, got the key from my place, walked inside. My girlfriend was sleeping naked under the sheets. Simultaneously, my roommate was getting ready for work, so who's in the shower? So both of them, they got walked in on naked in two separate rooms. So they're pretty upset. I was the only person who had, like, had some decency and got clothed, and <laughs> then they came to me. And I, I had no idea what to do. Um, and I read the search warrant. I still didn't know if it was about MySpace. Uh, so I was like, I kind of hope it's for MySpace. Uh, so I read the search warrant, and they mentioned MySpace. 
And then finally they had the address that they were allowed to search. And then there was another address. I was like, what's this? And I was like, oh no, this is my company. It's like, you guys are going to go to my company too? And they're like, we're already there. Apparently, another dozen agents were in the company I had started two years prior, probably 30 employees at that point. And I don't know what happened. All I know is I talked to, I talked to the CEO later, and he's like, yeah, they came in. They said, you know, I, I co-founded it with him. And they said, you know, who runs this place? And Chris, the CEO, came out and said, yeah, me. He said, what does Sam and Camp Car, Camp Car have access to? It's like, oh, everything. So the guy looks back to the other guy, all right, take everything. <laughs> And we're like a hybrid hosted system entirely dependent on the servers. And I don't know what they said. Maybe he like ultimately told him I was an intern or something and got him just to take my computer and nothing else, uh, fortunately. And then for six months back and forth, I uh, fought with the district attorney in Los Angeles. And what was super interesting is that MySpace never came after me. This was the government. This was entirely the government that came after me and said, Sammy, you know, you shouldn't have written that worm. Which I shouldn't have. <laughs> I think that's obvious. Uh, and going back and forth, we finally came to an agreement. Three years, no computer. Some amount of restitution, uh, probation, uh, basically until I'm uh, a good person. Uh, Caltrans Community Service, basically picking up trash on the side of the road for 720 hours, which felt like a lot more. Um, so all of that, and basically, uh, technically, I wouldn't be able to touch a computer or the internet for the rest of my life unless I'm on good, good behavior. So at some point in the future, I could go back and say, hey, I've been good. I haven't written any, any other viruses. Um, you can give me a computer again. And this was all under the Patriot Act. And so I agreed to that. And then I went for three years, and I didn't touch a computer. And uh, after that, I went back to court, and they said, okay, Sammy. Uh, you've been good. So three years later, I was able to touch a computer again. No more, pro no more probation, probation, paid off everything, and I was back. And I was like, wow, that was, that was a really interesting part of my life. Um, actually going from not having a high school diploma, not knowing anything but computers, to not touching a computer at all. Uh, and definitely one of the th most interesting parts of my life. I I'd say it's very cool, and, and I'm kind of happy it happened to me. Uh, but once I was back, I thought, like, what do I do next? Like, computers and hacking is still super, super interesting to me. Like, there's something really intoxicating about being able to, I mean, it's a puzzle, right? So it's like, solving a puzzle is fun. You feel kind of good after you solve a puzzle in, like, let's say, a book, right? But someone had designed that puzzle for you to solve. When you're hacking something, when you're breaking into something, you're trying to solve a puzzle that was never meant to be solved in the first place. It's even more exciting, right? No one meant for you to get to that entrance or exit, but you got there anyway. They thought they had like they had drawn walls all around, and they had it. Um, so there's something really, really cool about that. So I thought when I come back, I should look into stuff that might help consumers and might help people just understand what's happening, because I'm not a malicious person. I just like you know, breaking into things. How can I do that <laughs> and still not go to jail? <laughs> so when I came back to computers, I, I just started looking at other technologies that were interesting to me. So drones, who remembers when Amazon said they were going to start flying drones around and delivering packages? All right. So I think drones are really cool. Um, they're really exciting technology. I mean, mobile has pushed the cost down of so many things like accelerometers, gyroscopes, IMUs. Um, and now we can have drones for $100. You can go get a drone that flies around and uses GPS and um, can do some pretty amazing things. But I don't necessarily want a drone flying down my street. <laughs> Right, dropping off packages or meet people, you know, kids throwing rocks at it or it dropping things on people. And I thought that's kind of cool that Amazon's doing this. It might work in you know some uh, areas where there's not a lot of dense population. But what's the security? Like, is there security with drones? So that day I went out uh, when they announced this, and I got the the most ubiquitous consumer drone at the mo at the time, uh, the Parrot AR drone. And I found that I could actually take it over. I could get in. So I created something called Skyjack as an open source project to demonstrate some of the security issues with today's drones. And essentially, Skyjack, you'd fly around like a normal drone. And it would fly around looking for the wireless signals of any other drone within wireless distance, at which point it would take all of them over and produce a swarm of zombie drones under your control. <laughs> that you can now fly around and do anything. 
And at this point, I was also interested in data and privacy. Like there's, some, you know, we now have mobile phones and there's so much data that's constantly leaving our phone every single day. What's going on? Like, how do we know what's leaving? How do we know what we're actually putting out there? Like, do we even know what we're putting out there every day? I don't. I personally don't. So like, what's some of the stuff that's happening? I started just looking into the projects that are coming out and there's some amazing stuff coming out. Um, MIT made something called Gaydar and they could tell you your sexuality from your Facebook profile even if you didn't say it. So they would actually look at your Facebook profile, all the public information, even though you didn't specify your sexuality, they'd be like, oh, by the way, you're gay. <laughs> like, actually, you really are. It's a, it, or they'd say you're straight. And they would tell you with full accuracy. It's absolutely insane. They're doing this from data that is in, entirely available, even though you might be trying to hide something, even though you may want to keep something you know, private to yourself. Another website that's absolutely incredible, pleaserobme.com. Has anyone seen this? Please rob me, it's great. So basically, whenever someone like me goes on, or like any of us, go on Twitter and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to OWASP, I'll be in DC, I won't be in LA. It says, oh, by the way, Sammy just left his house, you can go rob him, he'll be gone for three days. <laughs> we put this out there, right? It, it has my name on there right now because I'm here. Uh, but that's amazing, right? That's, that's, that's really funny. Um, it, it scours Foursquare and Twitter and Facebook for the information that we're actually giving. And I think there's like so much incredible information that we're putting out there and so many easy ways to attack things that it's really cool to see it. It's really cool to see all the ways that, you know, if you're targeting someone, what are the ways that, that you could attack them? If you're doing a shotgun approach, what are the methods? What are the techniques that are possible? And how can we secure ourselves against them? This is Matt Honan. I feel, I feel bad for this guy. He's an editor at Wired. He woke up one day and his Gmail had been hacked and his Twitter had been hacked, and his iCloud had been hacked. His MacBook was empty, everything was deleted. His iPad, everything gone. His iPhone, everything deleted. Racial slurs coming from his Twitter. Basically, people had broken into his Amazon account. And in Amazon, you can't do much. Maybe you can order some books for him. But they hacked into his Amazon account and got the last four digits of his credit card number. And then they called Apple, and they're like, hey Apple, you know, I lost my iCloud account info. I'm like, okay, well, what's the last four digits of your credit card number, we'll verify you. And iCloud gave him, gave him access to the, gave the hackers access to his account. They broke in. They got into iCloud. They deleted his MacBook. They deleted his iPad. They deleted his iPhone. They deleted all backups, everything about everything that he had, all his information, all of his data. And then they went into his email and then changed the passwords of all of his social networks and then deleted everything on there and then started doing racial, <laughs> racial slurs. Um, absolutely crazy what you can do from those four numbers, right? The last four of your credit card which is funny because I got full credit card numbers from so many of you as you walked in, it's great. <laughs> John McAfee, okay, who remembers John McAfee? Yeah, this guy, oh my God, he's insane. Um, <laughs> uh, who still uses McAfee antivirus? Yeah. Yeah. No, a couple people, it's still around. Um, oh man, so he was on the lam for, you know, in connection with the murder of his neighbor uh, somewhere in Central America. And then Vice caught up with him, and an editor at Vice actually went on the lam with him, and they documented. And uh, it was really fun to read, um, especially when they accidentally left the EXIF coordinates, the GPS coordinates of the image. So as soon as they released the image, someone found the GPS coordinates. He was captured two days later. Right? We do this every time we take an image, every time we take a picture with our phones. We leave that GPS data in there. I leave it in there. I'm const people constantly tell me all my images have like my location. I'm like, ah oh, man, I forgot. Now I have a script that just runs constantly on my, uh, on my web server, replacing that GPS information with the NSA's location. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can take this, this is a, a friend of mine, he, uh, he posts pictures up on Twitter, and I just, download his, uh, <laughs> I just download his images, I'd extract the GPS, and then I made a little website so you could just track him wherever he went over time, and where the images were, and where they were taken. Um, and there's so much other cool stuff that's coming out, like HTML5 geolocation. This stuff is really, really cool. So a few years ago, I found that I could actually go, using HTML5 geolocation, a new feature within the browser, I could go to a website, execute some JavaScript, and that would basically return to me the exact physical coordinates of where it was. I was like, this is amazing. Now, normally you'd have to authorize it. So it would say, do you want to allow this website to know your location? So instead, I just use simple cross-site scripting uh, to access your MAC address from your router, and then I take that information for you automatically whenever you visit my website, and I send it to Google. And then Google would return with the physical coordinates of where you were. I was like, how does that even work? And apparently, it's through Street View. 
So Google Street View cars, not only are they taking photos of everywhere, of everywhere they're driving, but they're also triangulating that with, co with the coordinates and of all of the wireless MAC addresses around. So any router, whether it's encrypted or not, the MAC address is entirely public. So they're taking that, they're taking the signal strength and then putting it up in their database. So now, whenever you send a MAC address to Google, they will know exactly where you are, more accurately than GPS because of the strength, the signal strength of all of the wireless networks. And I was like, this is awesome. So now when you visit my website, I don't even, I don't even ask you, I know exactly where you are. Like Jack Bauer style, I know exactly where you're located. <laughs> And I started talking about this, and I, I went to Slovakia and did a talk um, around some of this geolocation stuff, which I thought was a really cool exploitation. And they're like, well, that's a really cool attack, Sammy, but fortunately, well, they said it like, oh, that's a very a very cool attack, Sammy. Uh, it's a Sl my Slavic accent. But they said that it's illegal for Street View cars to exist over there, so they don't do it. I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So then we tested it anyway, and it still knew exactly where we were. Exactly. So how were they doing that? Well, what does Google have everywhere? Android. Android. Um, Android devices are absolutely everywhere. And apparently they, had, they weren't saying this, but every Android device in the world was war driving, taking information about every single router around you, whether you're on that router or not, taking your GPS location, taking the signal strength of every wireless network, and triangulating all of that and sending it up to Google, and they're now storing it. Oh, and so is iPhone, and so is Windows. All of these phones are doing that. And I discovered that actually the Windows phone and iPhone would continue to take this information after you've disabled GPS or location services. So after you said no, it'd be like, oh, you want to use Maps? Sorry, you disabled this. But we'll still collect that information anyway. <laughs> so like, there's got to be a fun way to release, a cool way to release this. This information, because all of it was encrypted and obfuscated. No one had, no one had determined this yet that this was actually happening. So I created an app that essentially was, that would basically take you from a source to your destination, just like Google Maps. So you put in, you know, I'm at this address right now, this hotel, and I'd like to go to this bar down the street. And you'd get turn-by-turn -turn directions in my app. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, I found that it, it was actually, Google is using this crowdsource information to show you live traffic. So that's how you get live traffic view. So my app, whenever I want to go somewhere, I'd type in the directions and it would tell me how to get there. And simultaneously, it would send thousands and thousands of fake Android requests to Google saying, I'm an Android device, I'm on this route, and I'm moving zero miles per hour. So that everyone else would get a red and black line on my route and get diverted to different roads. <laughs> um, you can purchase the app for me later if you'd like, if you're interested. <laughs> So this is just absolutely incredible. And uh, there's so many new technologies coming out, and I thought, what else is coming out? What's the new research that's coming out that's, that's really exciting? So I'd love to just share with you some of the stuff that I think is super exciting to me, super scary. Um, some of the, the things that I think are happening today, I think governments, corporations might be using against us um, that we don't quite know, that we don't quite know about yet, and are happening with low-cost tools. Um, this is a really cool quote that, uh, that I saw on Major Malfunctions' website. In my experience, once data becomes invisible, something magical happens. They forget about security, right? If we can't see it, we just, we don't, we don't know it. Um, so, you know, originally very cool attacks started with uh, uh, compromising emanations um, via Tempest attacks. So since the 60s, uh, the NSA was able to basically take information from a monitor from a CRT in another room just based off the RF emanations. They were able to see what was on that monitor, and they weren't even in the room. And that was in the 60s. I mean, th this kind of stuff is like has progressed, and you can't necessarily uh, do that with an LCD. But there's so many other cool attacks like that that I th think are incredible. Um, at DEF CON a few years ago, someone demonstrated that you could use a laser, or you, you essentially use a laser and bounce it off a laptop. And as soon as it bounces off the laptop and you pick it up, you can then detect unique vibrations from that laptop. What are those unique vibrations? Those are keystrokes. So when you're typing a key, if you're typing the A key. That's next to the S key. Well, the A key has a unique signature of how it vibrates due to the location on the keyboard. And an S key also has a unique signature based off where it is on the keyboard. So even though you don't know they press the A key versus the S key, you can distinguish that those are two separate keys. And you can distinguish that, oh, it looks like the same key was pressed again, and again, and again. But what key is pressed the most? If you're writing English, for example, the space, the space bar. So now you have word boundaries. 
So once you get about 100 characters of the language that you know, at least in English, you can then start to do frequency analysis. Um, so you, the, can you see that? Okay. Yeah, you can do frequency analysis and figure out exactly what letter and what word and exactly everything someone is typing. Then you have like consumer FLIR cameras, infrared cameras that can pick up uh, thermal radiation. So you can, after someone types in their PIN number, you can just go and take a picture of the ATM pad and pick off their number. Here it's 12345, right? Just the, their heat signature touching the, touching each code. Um, there's been some, some French research where they found that people were able to essentially put a card, a, a smart card in the middle of a credit card. So when you, let's say you were stealing credit cards and you wanted to do chip and pin transactions, it would verify that the chip is there, the chip is there. It would then do a pin request and you'd put in the pin for the man in the middle, for essentially the, uh, the, the really the top chip is your chip. And you'd say, oh, here's my pin. And then when you wanted to run the transaction, it would then bypass everything and then send it to the next chip underneath, which was the stolen card. So you just paste this little thing on top and now you have a chip and pin card that is legitimate chip and pin, validates your pin signature, and you get, free, get to buy free stuff. <laughs> so cool. Um, I recently did a, a project just looking at how uh, mag stripes work. And you can just take any credit card and stick it in black iron oxide filings. And you can literally read every single bit bit by bit, with the naked eye, off of a credit card. Um, and I started seeing, what else can I do with that? Uh, quickly, I discovered that I can start detecting, let's say, Amex numbers. Um, I uh, created something called MagSpoof, which is a little device that you can just put up to any normal MagStripe reader. This is not NFC or RFID. Normal MagStripes. Produce a strong electromagnetic field, and then uh, emulate a swipe. So I can make essentially a credit card that, let's say if I found your Amex, I found that Amex has a very simple sequence that they continue. So if you steal someone's Amex or find it, you can then use their card. And as soon as it stops working, as soon as they've ca called the credit card company, you press a button and you get their next Amex number before they even have it and start using it again. Uh, so many amazing things. Uh, Berkeley did some such, such, such cool research where they actually used the microphone to, to track acoustic emanations from keyboard keystrokes. So similar to the laser, they were using sound. They are using simply uh, sound on a phone. And they did this on an iPhone. They went into an office, set the iPhone down on a desk, someone typed a sentence, and they could extract exactly what that person was typing. Exactly. Absolutely nuts. There's the accelerometer, where people have used the accelerometer in background apps to track what you're typing, to track pin numbers. So if there's an app in the background, they can access the accelerometer, they can access the gyroscope and magnetometer and take that data and then use it for other purposes. I mean, they're just, take, they're just finding out what you're typing to your friend um, entirely in the background. The University of Israel uh, in Tel Aviv uh, uh, are doing a ton of really cool things. They're doing acoustical intelligence where they also take an Android phone and they set it down next to a computer. And the computer starts encrypting an email via PGP. And the, the phone simply listens. And phones can listen to more frequencies than we can. So they can actually hear ultrasound. And they can hear the ultrasound coming off the capacitors and resistors around the CPU. And doing an, an encryption, like encrypting an email via PGP, is a pretty heavy, you know, computationally expensive operation that produces another unique signature. If it uses, let's say, a one bit for the first bit of the key, it's going to take one operator versus a different operator that uses a different amount of power and ultrasound. So they can listen to the key as it's being, as it's encrypting the email, and they can extract a full 4096-bit RSA key from that, from an Android device, unmodified, with software, today. You can do that. You can download software and do this today. Who is already doing this? Like, are people already doing this? Electrical outlets. Uh, uh, other people at DEF CON showed that you can actually go into any room and plug into an electrical outlet. And that ground line is shared with every other ground line on, on the circuit. And if someone has a computer plugged in with a leaky keyboard, they're typing on their keyboard. And those emanations are the, 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 the electrons that are traveling through the, let's say, USB, get onto, uh, will leak onto the ground, the ground of your computer, which is plugged in to the same ground that's plugged into the rest of the circuit. And from another circuit on the ground line, you can hear the same, uh, the same keystrokes and pick up those keystrokes. Oh my god, bag of chips. Who's seen one of these? If you ever see one of these, you need to watch out. This is a Lay's bag of chips. Uh, researchers at MIT put this thing in a soundproof room 
They put up soundproof glass and then took a standard DSLR camera from 15 feet away and looked at the bag of chips. People in the room talked, and their talking produced sound waves, which produced vibrations in the air, which vibrated onto the bag of chips. When they extracted the vibrations from the DSLR camera outside of the room, they converted that frequency of change back to frequency in sound and played back what they said inside the room. The soundproof room. They used a DSLR camera and a bag of chips. <laughs> so watch out for these bags of chips. Uh, and now, I mean, <laughs> people are buying e-cigarettes and they're just getting malware. Like, e-cigarettes really are unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> They plug it in to recharge the first time, and it gives them malware onto their computer. Um, if anyone's interested in this, uh, I do have a project on my GitHub where I've decrypted the firmware of a common e-cigarette, um, and I'm working on also malicious firmware. So even if they bought it in the store and they plug it into recharging your computer, you can give them malware, where the, where the uh, e-cig can then act, emulate an HID keyboard. So they charge it on your computer, it downloads the new firmware, they go back home, they recharge it, it starts typing on their keyboard. <laughs> it starts injecting stuff. And of course, so many devices, I mean, running operating systems, you know, you have your voice over IP phones, you have wireless keyboards, right? All, things, all of these are full computers. You have IME uh, toys from Mattel, which have RF chips that, that are, are full transceivers under, under a gigahertz. They can transmit and receive. Um, I found that you can basically open up any garage in under 10 seconds using this girl's toy. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. So much radio frequency and so much new stuff coming out, right? Uh, if you take any car, it has hundreds and hundreds of computers. Literally hundreds of computers in a single vehicle today, right? Microcontrollers are everywhere. Um, and no one's, you know, very few people are looking at all the different, different ways, all the different ways that we can attack something. Um, so I'm really excited about this, this next stretch of attacks, sort of the next generation of these attacks. I think a lot of them, you know, come from this physical phenomena, things that are technically not, you know, logically are not necessarily insecure. It's just as a byproduct of the way physics works and the way radio frequency works and electromagnetism, um, that we're leaking so much information, we can exploit so much. I think we can come out with some cool new attacks and, I love to see new attack vectors. So, you know, I, I ask all of you, let's, let's, let's look for some, some uh, new hacks, some new attacks. Um, of course, I'm not going to leave you with, with all that scary stuff. There is a way to protect yourself. <laughs> I mean, a little tinfoil goes a long way. Um, but seriously, uh, you know, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to share some of this stuff, and I hope to see some, some cool uh, methods of security and, and also attacks from the rest of you. Thanks for having me. I also have time for questions, if anyone has any. Or I can recharge your e-cigarette if you'd like to bring it up. <laughs> Uh, hey, Sam. Hey. I have a question. Hey. Uh, so I can't believe that I'm the only one to, to think of this, but what did you do for three years <laughs> when you weren't touching a computer? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I had no idea what to do. The first week, the first week was the hardest. Uh, and then I like went outside and was like, ah, what is that? I realized there's the sun. And I started just doing, I turned like 20, 21. So at that point, I actually, you know, I could go out. I went, went out with friends. Um, I made friends. I learned to socialize a little bit. Uh, I learned to drink a little bit. Uh, I went to the gym. I read books. Um, I still worked, right? So I still, at that point, I just managed, right? I didn't touch computer. Instead, I just managed a team that did, did all the work for me, right? I think, yeah, fortunately. Um, and I don't know, I got used to it. You know, by the time I came back, I bought a new computer. I bought a, a PowerBook, right? I didn't have MacBooks yet. I bought a PowerBook the day I could got back. And I went to Slashdot. And I looked for like three minutes and was like, I'm bored. <laughs> shut it, I shut it down and I just like called some friends and went, went to hang out. I think we adapt pretty quickly. I'd just say the only hard, only really hard part of that experience was no Google Maps, right? Getting somewhere, it's very difficult without a map, without a Google map. Like, I had to use paper. It sucked. Uh, any other questions? Okay. When you're planning something new to exploit, where do you start? Like, what's your strategy? 
Um, that's a good question. I, I'd say it's it's less planning, right? So it's very much um, just seeing things in the world that I'm like, oh, that would be cool. I wonder if there's any issues there, and then starting. Um, so I guess my uh, to tell you about the basics of my strategy and. It's, not really foolproof or anything. It's just uh, how I've always approached things. Is I'm I'm interested in a certain output, right? I want this device, framework, system, whatever, to output a certain way. And then I I first I guess I just start looking at the inputs. What are all the possible inputs into the system? And I think I try to I also try to you know more and more think about inputs that you wouldn't necessarily think of. If you think of a computer, you think the inputs are the uh, camera, the microphone, the keyboard, the mouse, um, any of the ports, obviously, right? USB, Thunderbolt. Um, HDMI, you know, power. Power itself is an input. You can do power glitching. Um, I think that's really interesting. Messing with the actual power that's going to something. You can po pull from power. If you're plugged into USB, you can actually pull from power. You don't necessarily need to do a data, uh, a data attack on the USB data lines. You can actually mess with the power. Um, uh, environment, right? The environment is an input to your device, to your to your system. So the temperature. Is an, is an input. Can you mess with the temperature? Um, you know, like a cold boot attack, right? That's, a, that's messing with the environment of a computer. If you have encryption keys that are stored in memory and you want to extract those, you know, you can use, uh, uh, what is it, canned air, spray it upside down, freeze the memory so you get seconds to minutes where you can pull that memory out, plug it into your own device, and then dump that memory. Um, so I'd say it's first looking at all the inputs and then how can I control each input? And is there some sort of combination of inputs that might produce an output that I want? Um, and I'd say also just like if you can merge layers. So if I'm looking at, let's say, a technology, I'm not necessarily looking at just one layer. I'm not necessarily looking at just the web layer. I might be looking at the IP layer as well um, or the network layer. Uh, I might be looking at the physical layer. And then sometimes you can do really cool attacks where it's a combination of layers that independently you might not be able to attack by itself. There's like a, a really cool thing called the the uh, the Agar AGGR Wi-Fi attack, where essentially on an open Wi-Fi network, if you visited a certain image, they could inject traffic onto your Wi-Fi network, like they could ARP spoof, and that was because they're attacking multiple layers by using an open wireless network. You would basically everything is going unencrypted, and when you access that image, inside the image are actually Wi-Fi packets. Now, normally, your Wi-Fi driver doesn't see those Wi-Fi packets. It just sees data as an image. But if for any reason you're, there's, let's say, uh, overlap of the Wi-Fi frequency, the wireless frequency, then it might miss a byte and then skip to the next byte. And it happens to be that that next byte is a legitimate Wi-Fi data. And it reads that Wi-Fi data and says, oh, this is an ARP packet that's about to be injected to take over the gateway. I better send that. <laughs> Um, so there's some really cool attacks when you, I think, when you mix, when you learn about the different levels. Um, so I'd say, uh, I'd say the for me, like a lot of my attacks are very simple, um, but because I can, I can look at different layers and different areas and put them together and merge them, that makes them a lot more powerful. Yes. Do you trust anything? <laughs> I mean, I think Mulder said it best: trust no one. Um, you know, trust trust is interesting. Like, you know, I trust people. I, I trust people a lot, and uh, I also expect that trust from them too. Um, so I'd say, uh, you know, I don't necessarily trust devices. I'm, I understand. I I built products, and you know, when you're building something, your goal is to build a product, not to build a secure product, right? And no one's going to pay you extra for that security. Right? That's typically not how it works. People aren't aren't, aren't like, I want a secure IP camera. No, they're like, I want an IP camera, <laughs> right? That's usually what people want. So you're always going to be pushed to get something out faster rather than more secure. I understand that. Um, so you know, yeah, I don't necessarily trust devices, but I still use them, and I'm o I'm also okay with being, let's say, I use insecure software, I use insecure hardware. It's going to happen. I'm going to be exploited. I'm going to get hacked. It's the way of life. Like we could all be scared and never leave our houses, but I want to use this technology. I think this is really cool to use, and uh, I accept the risk that uh, I'm going to get pwned. <laughs> yes. So we have been our mindset here. We are all kind of security people. We understand what you have done, where you come from. But if you go tell this story to people who don't know anything about it, they'll freak out. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't think they're going to like run around with their heads cut off like a chicken, right? But but that might make them think next time they put uh, I want them to actually think when they go and put a Bluetooth block on their door, right? I just want you to like go through that extra mental process 
oh wait, this guy like scared me once because of something. And I don't think this stuff is unreasonable, right? Everything I showed was low cost. That was my, that's my focus. That's my focus in life because I've always, I haven't had a lot to, to buy with when I was younger and that's what I learned. How can I use open source tools, free tools, things that are low cost that anyone can do? All of that stuff was like under $100, any of those attacks, which is incredible, right? So I want you to at least think about those types of attacks that can be done for a very small amount before you go and put a Bluetooth lock on your door, right? I think about my mom, like, if my, is my mom gonna get hacked? Is someone gonna break into her car because the security sucks? And yes, I broke into her car. Uh, but, <laughs> but I'm like, can other people do that, right? <laughs> I wanna see, like, can we improve that? in the smaller ways, right? Not necessarily the government back, the nation state funded ways. And that'll happen no matter what. Yeah. So you can't really assume like, you know, technical literacy unless you have like or like of the general public. Um, and also you your kids as law enforcement and prosecutors. So when you were uh, under that thing, uh my space were did you ever frustrated or were your attorneys were frustrated with uh, lack of technical background perhaps in the law enforcement and um, good question. Oh, the, the question was, was I ever frustrated in going through the MySpace stuff, uh, the lack of technical competence in, I guess, the government, right? Um, so I'd say I wasn't upset about it. Uh, you know, the first day I went, right, they, they take your, like, fingerprints. And um, so I, I go up to the, this is the high-tech crimes unit, by the way. Literally, the high-tech crimes unit, I go into a room, guy takes me there. And he says, all right, we're gonna take your fingerprints, put your like finger, your hand on this thing, put my hand on. He starts like pressing the button to like make it work. I'm like, dude, that's not a touch screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we had to use the mouse. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's, there's a little lack of competence uh, in some of those areas. And some, some, I met some people who were, you know, technically competent. So it's definitely not all that way. Was I frustrated? No, I mean, it's kind of to be expected, right? It's, I think it's also hard to, it's hard to maybe make that interesting enough to get a lot of te technically competent people. But I think more and more people are trying, right? I know a lot of government agencies are now at DEF CON, which is pretty cool. Like, I like seeing that. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'd like for more technical competent people to be there, but I, I never really got upset about it. Yes? So if we're heading into, um, well, this will sound more dramatic than it probably is. If we're heading into a world where uh, we're now starting to see people with a hacker mindset uh, challenging fundamental, like fundamental physical assumptions of devices that are expecting inputs uh, and succeeding with attacks, in my mind, that would say that we're starting to enter a realm where it becomes potentially impossible to secure against some vectors of attack uh, or to anticipate them. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but I'm also saying that there are going to be plenty of people at higher levels, like decision-making levels, that might come to that conclusion and then say, then what's the point of security? Uh, How do you counter that? I, I mean, you could say, what's the point of security at any point in time just because there's an exploit? I mean, yeah. and I disagree. I do think you can be, uh, you make a good point and a valid point, um, but I do think you can, uh, solve for many of these. So for example, in a, in a power attack where something is using more power when it takes one bit of a key versus another, you can design in assembly uh, a route so that they take the same amount of power no matter what that bit is, no matter what that input is. Um, so very like power agnostic or, or uh, power symmetric uh, usage. And people are doing that now. People are starting to implement that sort of thing um, when it comes to crypto. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think we all know here, right? It's not about having perfect security. Right? There is no perfect yeah. security, right? But it is about layers. So do, do you have enough layers that you are comfortable with the amount of risk that there is? And it's more about, can we understand the risk? Can we understand the risk of not having 10 different firewalls and no one visiting our page and buying our stuff because we don't allow port 80 to be open, right? Uh, <laughs> or mad secure. Um, I'm sorry, 443. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, you know that's just a, a continuous thing that depending your organization, your company, your family needs to decide how much do I care, uh, how much is of a risk is this, and you know hopefully we can just be a little more educated and, and make better assumptions about that. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. You ever released uh, your research back in June at Watch LA? Oh, uh, uh, the USB poison tap stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I got, uh, 
Oh, man. No, it's just like documenting is the hardest part, right? Actually, like going and sitting in a markdown editor and like typing, oh, I'm going to kill myself. Um, no, but I'd be happy to share it with you. You know, yeah, I've had a project out for a while that's able to extract information from a, a locked US computer over USB. So you plug it in, and essentially it then takes all sorts of awesome uh, authority from your computer, and then you pull it out and you walk away, and it looks like nothing ever happened, even though the computer was locked and password protected. Um, no, I, hopefully you should remind me, and, and I'll send it to you, or I'll stop being lazy and release it in the next month or two. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So one of the themes I think I heard in your exploits as you talked through it is the the use of general purpose chipsets in ostensibly single purpose devices, general purpose operating systems or radios or whatever. So short of literally making new chips, what can we do about that? Well, I, I and was I correct? Uh, I I don't think you know. Uh, I think general purpose is great because it, it's reusable, right? We can use it in a lot of different areas. I don't think that's necessarily the problem. Um, can you give me an example of like what you saw that was maybe a general purpose chipping? Abuse? So the uh, the IM knee device, okay. like clearly uh, wasn't intended to open garage doors. Absolutely, but I don't think that's a I don't think that's a flaw with the IME. I think it's a flaw with the garages. Okay. Right. Uh, it's kind of like I don't. Yeah, it, it's not. The garage is what was exploited. Uh, it just happened to me that IME had really cool, like you said, general purpose chip and hardware that allowed that. Um, and it's a cool color. So I think it's just a, it just seemed ripe for, uh, ripe for hacking. Um, yeah, I don't actually think there's any flaw with the Mattel device. I think it's actually cool that it's rewritable and that you can reflash it and put in new firmware, even if they didn't necessarily intend that. Um, so yeah, I don't see any problem there. It's like, it's not necessarily the knife manufacturer, it's the person like stabbing someone. A tool. Right. Yeah, it's not necessarily the tool, it's just the you know, where the flaw lies. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. You said about the, the risk you accept when you use a device, but what is but the devices you don't have a choice, like pace uh, metal devices, pacemakers. Mm. Uh, did you do any research on that? Oh uh, no. It sounds like scary stuff. <laughs> it is. And I yeah, ugh, all the med sex stuff just like <laughs> disgusts me. Um no, I mean that that is scary. I'm kind of like I, I would just be. I'm kind of afraid to to look at that stuff, right? Because you're gonna find stuff, and and then I don't even know what the right course of action is. Because now you're talking about harming people, or not intentionally, right? Like how do you how do you navigate those waters, those muddy waters? Um, and I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yes. I'm sorry, what's my what? What's your suggestion for budding security engineers to switch their jobs and become hackers or? How about my <laughs> suggestion to, to become a security genius? Um, Suggestions, yeah. Um, I'll have to ask some security geniuses I know. And I would say, you know, I, I'd say probably the, the, the best thing that helped me get you know, I, I always wanted to be a hack like that as a kid, right? I wanted to hack stuff. Um, but the thing that like really, really catapulted me, I think, or, or helped me learn in different areas, um, was learning to code. Like learning to actually write code was the most powerful thing because then you could like write tools that automate things. And then when you start writing tools, um, you're like, oh man, even my tool is exploitable. And you start learning about, you know, how errors in your own logic. And I make a lot of errors. So I learned like all those different issues that I made writing programs or writing software, designing hardware, other people must think as well. Because you know, we're, we're all, we'll think the same, we'll do things essentially the same. So um, I'd say that was the best thing, to see what it's like on the other side um, will we'll help you understand so much more than just learning on the security side. Uh, just learning how to attack something, I think you're, you're limited by scope of what other people have published. Uh, of attacking. But when you're writing that code, then you'll see other things that you wouldn't necessarily see otherwise. All right, that was the last question. Let's, Let's get Sammy another so round of applause. Awesome. Thank you.